Developing right now on Morning News Now, it is a summer scorcher unlike any other. This morning, millions of Americans are bracing for more triple-digit heat after three days of record-breaking average temperatures worldwide. Right now, heat alerts are already in effect in several states from Arizona to Florida. And in other parts of the country, a severe storm system is threatening millions with more heavy rain, high winds, even tornadoes. Our team is tracking it all. Also this morning, a powder probe in the West Wing, a white substance found at the White House, now officially confirmed to be cocaine. The big question remains, who brought it in? We'll bring you the latest on the investigation, plus what the Biden administration is saying now. Plus, a devastating diagnosis that could be a game changer for women in sports. Scientists have confirmed the first ever case of the degenerative brain disease CTE in a female pro athlete. But we're learning about her condition and what this first of its kind case could mean for all of women's sports. And proof that the early bird gets the worm. This morning, Twitter's newest competition is live after launching one day ahead of schedule. And already, Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg says millions of users have signed up. What you need to know about the app and how it could change the social media world. Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. Savannah is on assignment. We begin with those blistering temperatures. They're being felt not just across the country, but all across the globe. Countries from Japan, India, China to right here in the United States are dealing with oppressive heat, and it's hitting historic levels. The average global temperature spiked Monday to a record high of 62.6 degrees. Tuesday, the world's record heat climbed even higher to 62.9 degrees. And yesterday, the global temperature remained at that record high. States like Florida and Connecticut have activated extreme weather plans to try and help people stay safe in the face of these dangerous temps. And some folks are also finding their own ways to beat the heat. Drinking a lot of Gatorade, water, staying hydrated. Always parks that have sprinklers. We carry a lot of water. We spray them down all day. Got to be creative. We've got team coverage with the latest on this extreme heat. We're going to begin with NBC News meteorologist Michelle Grossman, who has the latest forecast. Michelle, good morning. Good morning, Joe. And I'm going to say more of the same because we have been stuck in this pattern for week after week after week. We're looking at severe weather. We're looking at that heat that you just talked about. So starting with the severe weather risk, because we're seeing some strong storms uh, this morning. Looking at radar, you can see some pop-up storms. That's going to be the case throughout the Gulf Coast states, the southeast, into portions of the Carolinas. But it's into the central plains and northern high plains. That's where we're going to see the bullseye for some really heavy storms. Seeing some lightning. We even have some thunder, severe thunderstorm watches, severe thunderstorm warnings. We've been watching that pretty much all night long. We're going to continue to watch this as we go throughout the day. Notice all these bright colors too, especially down near that severe thunderstorm warning. We're seeing some hail. That's where you see the purple. Also seeing some really heavy downpours. A lot of these thunderstorms are going to drop a lot of rain and that could lead to some flash flooding. And this is the reason why we have an area of cold front that's moving through very slowly. So it's sort of parked over the area. We have some cool air coming down from Canada. So the cold front with the cool air, kind of a trigger for these strong storms. And we're going to see them really fire up as we head throughout the later part of today. Same story as we go throughout tomorrow. So it's not just today in that part of the country. We're going to see more into the Rockies tomorrow. Also the chance for damaging winds and hail once again tomorrow. So for today, we're looking at 6 million at risk. We're looking at anywhere from Rapid City to Scotts Bluff, Denver, Lamar, and Deliberal. Where you see those yellows and the oranges, that's the indication of where the likeliest spot for these storms are. Then as we go throughout tomorrow, we're looking at a another 11 million at risk and notice it's the same area so we get that heavy rain we've been seeing uh, the rain for days Denver pretty much surpassed their year total already in terms of rainfall so tomorrow we're talking Denver, Wichita, Oklahoma City with winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour and some hail. And this is your rainfall forecast. It's not just the plains. It's not just the mid-Mississippi Valley. We're talking parts of Florida as well with those summer-like downpours into the Gulf Coast states. Also portions of southern Texas could see some really heavy rainfall. And it's going to come quickly. So two inches per hour. You want to be careful as you're out and about because that could lead to some flash flooding, especially in the portions of the plains. So Salina to Oklahoma City, you are under the threat for some flash flooding. So 
we have that stormy weather once again, the soggy weather. We're also watching some really high heat in some spots. Again, the southwest under excessive heat warning. And Joe, it's not just the southwest. We're looking at the northeast too. Syracuse could see temperatures well above normal for this time of year. Some spots into the 90s, feeling more like 100 degrees in some spots. I feel like I could see the humidity this morning. Like yes. I could just spell my name in the air or something. And I thought like yesterday too. I, I walked to the parking garage in between shows. I'm like, oh. Really? I know. <laughs> the air is just yeah, out of control. Growing. All right, Michelle, thanks so much. Sure. Appreciate it. As this heat wave continues, many parts of the country are also dealing with dangerous air quality alerts. NBC News correspondent Priscilla Thompson is in Houston with more on that. Priscilla, good morning. Oh, hey guys, good morning. This morning, more than 20 million Americans are waking up to more blistering temperatures under more heat alerts amid another week of brutal heat. We saw triple digit heat index in central Florida. They had to activate emergency plans on Wednesday because of just how hot it was getting. And we saw similar measures being taken in Connecticut. So this is really impacting cities all across the country. In fact, we saw record highs in places like Sarasota, El Paso and Portland. And what is perhaps most concerning is that this week the earth recorded some of the hottest days on record ever. And this comes as half of the world is in winter. But on Monday, we saw a record setting temperature of 62.6 degrees. And then that record was broken a day later when the global average temperature hit 62 9 degrees and experts are saying that this is not a good achievement that we are pushing our ecosystems to places that they have not gone before and we don't yet know what the implications of that will be now in addition to the extreme heat there are also millions of Americans who are under air quality alerts in the Northeast and the Midwest as Midwest as we grapple with another week of severe weather but some good news, we may be moving into a season of milder temperatures heading into this weekend, so folks may be able to get out and enjoy a nice summer weekend. Guys, back to you. We'll take that. Priscilla, thanks so much. Now to the latest on the legal troubles involving former President Trump and his handling of classified materials. More information has been released from the Mar-a-Lago search warrant. Joe's federal agents became concerned about the whereabouts of some documents after viewing security camera footage. We should point out an attorney for Trump did not respond to a request for comment last night. For more, we're joined by NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. Danny, good morning. So the affidavit says that the security camera footage from Mar-a-Lago show Trump ate walled nada moving boxes out of a storage area. What could evidence like this mean for the case? Video evidence from the beginning was always going to be important in this case, as it is increasingly in criminal cases everywhere. And sure enough, you have video apparently showing Walt Nauta moving these doc boxes of documents. Uh, then what the prosecutors need to prove is what Walt Nauta knew and when he knew it. But if they have him moving documents, that gives them the physical aspect of many of the alleged crimes, which is concealing these documents. That's one of the magic words in one of the statutes with which Nauta and Trump are charged. So uh, going from here, the next question is, well, who else moved documents? Who else knew about them? And the reality is those people are not named in the indictment. They may show up as cooperating witnesses. They may have provided evidence to the government. But what's interesting here is this begins to answer the question of, of all the potential defendants out there, of all the people in Trump's orbit, why this previously unknown person, Walt Nauta, why is he Trump's co-defendant in this indictment. And as you know, Nada was charged last month along with Trump in this 38 count indictment. He's expected to be arraigned today in Florida after a delay. So let's talk where his case goes from here. How much is it tied to Trump's case? And if he is convicted, what's the punishment he could face? He's a co-defendant. It's directly tied to Trump's case. And I think this is particularly interesting, the fact that Walt Nada has not yet been arraigned. And here's why. Walt Nada, all indications are that he is aligned with Trump in lockstep. They are co-defendants and uh, probably are uh, uh, under a joint defense agreement, although I don't know. But at this point, to what degree Walt Nauta has loyalty to Trump? He's apparently still working for him. This may change as the case uh, drags on over the months. And this case is not going to trial in this calendar year, in my opinion. In theory, it could. It's just not likely to happen. So as time drags on, Walt Nauta may reevaluate continuously whether or not he wants to be a co-defendant and go to trial with Donald Trump. This kind of disparate treatment, in other words, that 
Trump already has his lawyers and has been arraigned, but Walt Nauta, for whatever reason, doesn't have a lawyer and wasn't arraigned until at least now. So what does that say about Walt Nauta? At what point does he say, hey, why don't I have the same treatment as my co-defendant? Is he really in my corner? These are the kinds of things that may affect whether Walt Nauta decides down the road he wants to approach prosecutors for a deal or he wants to stick it out and go all the way to the bitter end, which is a trial, a very public trial, perhaps the most important, notorious trial in American criminal history. And real quick, I want to talk about that trial. We initially thought it could be in August. That always seemed unlikely. Now we know a special counsel, Jack Smith, he's requesting it start in December. Real quick, this is not surprising, is it? Not at all. And this is just one example of the dozens of different reasons why a trial, even a federal trial, and federal court moves a lot faster than state court, but even in federal court, when you have a case like this that involves very sensitive documents, uh, a very important defendant, a defendant that you have to essentially shut down the courthouse to even have a, uh, a simple appearance like an arraignment. So all of these things will contribute to the delay of this case, and we haven't even gotten into the defendant's Po, uh, dispositive motions, motions that he will file to try and throw the case out in its entirety. Those motions have to be briefed. They have to have a response, a reply. Uh, the judge has to consider them, and that's totally up to the judge. She can take as long as she wants. This case is not going to trial this year. It may not even go to trial next year. And that would be the election year. So, all right, Danny, thank you so much. I always appreciate your analysis. An unusual, an incredibly unusual whodunit is playing out in the West Wing. The Secret Service is investigating, trying to figure out who brought a small bag of cocaine into the White House. Officials say the bag was found Sunday night in a common area where staff and visitors store personal belongings, like cell phones, before they step closer to the heart of the president's office space. For more, we're joined by NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli. So, Mike, take us through the latest on this investigation. What do we know? Well, yesterday we learned that the laboratory came back with a more conclusive test confirming that it was indeed cocaine in this small dime-sized plastic bag. And interestingly, we learned late yesterday that the federal lab is continuing to examine this bag, looking for things like DNA or a fingerprint that might help indicate who brought it into the White House. Now, the Secret Service, as part of its investigation, is also looking through video of the West Wing there, looking through the visitor logs to try to determine uh, who was coming and going over the course of the weekend before this was found. But we also know that that helped narrow the location, the White House confirming that it was indeed this area where visitors uh, or individuals coming for meetings at the West Wing would might be asked to leave their personal items. That's significant because the strong suggestion at this early stage from the White House is that the person who likely brought this in to the West Wing was a visitor, not a White House staffer. But we understand why the White House would be trying to leave us with that impression. This has been an embarrassing story that has taken up quite a bit of attention from uh, the White House, not on the president's agenda. Yeah, and Mike, I mean, officials say this investigation could probably take a couple of weeks. I guess I would assume, oh, there's cameras everywhere. They're going to solve this right away. But what are some of the obstacles they're facing? Well, the single big, biggest question that sources familiar with the investigation say they still have not resolved was how long had this small baggie been in the location where it was discovered Sunday night? Is it something that was placed there on Sunday and quickly discovered? Or is it something that might have been there for days, weeks, even longer? Because that would significantly make it more complicated for investigators to try to determine where, uh, who might have brought it in by looking at things like the camera footage and the visitor logs. There's also the, every possibility, our sources are telling us, that there might not be enough forensic data on this baggie to help narrow down who it was. So that is the bottom line here, why they're tempering expectations about just how quickly we might learn who brought this in. And Mike, an important note, President Biden and his family were away from the White House when this was found. What are we hearing from the Biden administration about the investigation? Yeah, of course, we learned about this on the 4th of July holiday. So it was only yesterday that Karine Jean-Pierre, the White House press secretary, had to face questions. And she faced many, but ultimately she did not really offer much more than the fact that the White House is leaning on the Secret Service for this investigation. Listen to some of what the press secretary said yesterday. Where this was discovered uh, is a heavily traveled area where many White House, uh, West Wing, I should be even more specific, uh, West Wing visitors uh, come through. It is under investigation by the Secret Service. This is in their purview. We have confidence that the Secret Service would get to the bottom of this. 
Now, one of the questions I asked Karine Jean-Pierre yesterday was what would the consequences be if it's determined that this was a White House staffer or even the guest of a White House staffer? She said she would not engage in hypotheticals at this point, but she did say that all White House staffers are subject to routine drug testing as part of their employment there. All right, Mike Memoli, we'll be talking much more about this one in the coming days. Thank you so much. You be sure of that. Thanks. The suspect in the Philadelphia mass shooting is being held without bail. 40-year-old Kim Brady Carriker is facing multiple charges for money. Day shooting, which killed five people and injured two children. Officials say the suspect appeared to be shooting people at random. Now, authorities say the suspect had what they call a ghost gun. That means it's harder to trace and is usually built from parts of other guns. Two New Jersey firefighters were killed after they became trapped while fighting a fire on a docked ship. That fire broke out last night at Port Newark, just outside of Newark Airport. The docked ship contained thousands of cars with flames spreading on the ship's 11th and 12th floors. Newark's fire chief says the firefighters became lost after getting pushed back by the intense heat. They were later found inside the ship and pronounced dead. No word yet on what sparked that fire. It is a major, major discovery that could have huge implications for women in sports. Scientists have detected the first case of CTE in a professional female athlete. Australian football player Heather Anderson suffered multiple concussions during her career. Now, her death is still being investigated by officials, but researchers suspect that she did die by suicide. They also performed an autopsy on Anderson at her family's request and found markings that are consistent with CTE. NBC News senior medical correspondent Dr. John Torres joins us now to explain more about CTE and, and how this could impact women's sports. First, the basics remind us, what is CTE? How does it affect the brain? And good morning, Joe. We've known about CTE for years, mainly with men and men's professional sports. And what we're finding out is it's happening more and more. And up until now, we've seen women with CTE, but not professional sports women. And this is the first one. And essentially what happens with CTE is the brain gets enough of these hits that it ends up dying, the brain cells inside end up dying in certain areas, and it's called chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Encephalopathy means that that brain cell has been damaged, that brain area has been damaged, and unfortunately, this is a progressive disease, and it usually starts out with, with milder symptoms, headaches, forgetfulness, possibly irritability, anger issues, and then it eventually progresses to a dementia-type condition. And this is unfortunate, but we've seen this happen time and time again, the death by suicide from this. And we've seen it time and time again in male athletes. This is the first time in a female athlete, but women are more susceptible to concussions than men. So, I mean, does this diagnosis potentially change how doctors work with female athletes? I think it's going to change things. And the main thing that's going to change is that increased suspicion of this could possibly happen and also talking to female athletes especially young female athletes that hey this could be something that you need to be concerned with as well in her, Heather's case she ended up starting rugby or Australian rules football when she was five and has many many years of Australian rules football meaning many hits to the head that we think probably contributed to the CTE so remind us no matter who you are if you're an athlete what are the precautions you can take to try and keep yourself safe from and this? again that's probably the most important point no matter who you are if you play a sport where you get hits to the head. That can be football, that can be rugby, that can be soccer, that can be a lacrosse, a variety of different sports, then you need to worry about this. And the main thing is we have found out it's not the concussions that cause CTE, it's actually those sub-concussive hits where you get hits time and time and time again, and that turns out to be cumulative. So you don't have to have a concussion, you don't have to pass out. The main thing is to avoid those hits, learn how to tackle appropriately, learn how to play the sport without getting those impacts to the head appropriately, and that can be do the one thing that can hold hopefully stave this off over time. How much of a role is equipment playing right now in trying to keep people safe, keep athletes the safe? The main role equipment is playing is, is giving players that false impression this could protect them from concussions, this could protect them from CTE. But studies have shown both football helmets in regular American football and rugby type foam helmets like you saw Heather Anderson wearing in that picture we showed on her don't protect you necessarily from those sub-concussive hits because the brain inside, the skull still moves around when you get those hits, a little less energy. So so it's going to protect you a little bit over time, but it's not really going to protect you. And we don't think it offers much protection against CTE. This is still the wild west of diagnosis, the wild west of treatment, and the wild west certainly of cures clearly, going on here. We're just now making new discoveries now. All right, exactly. Dr. John Torres, thanks so much. Appreciate you it. Bet. And if you or anyone you know is struggling, you can call or text the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline at 988.
Still to come here on Morning News Now, fans behaving badly, a troublesome trend at live shows across the country, fans in the front rows throwing things at performers on stage. We're going to unpack the problem later this hour. But first, after the break, new developments on the war in Ukraine. What we're learning about what could be one of the biggest attacks on civilian infrastructure since the war began. We'll be right back. We're back with the latest from Ukraine. Officials say at least four people were killed in a Russian missile strike on the western city of Lviv. The attack is seen as one of the biggest on civilian infrastructure in that city since the war began. Let's get right to NBC News foreign correspondent Kelly Kobiea, who joins us from Kiev. So, Kelly, we know incidents like this are pretty rare in Lviv. You remember how many journalists were there at the beginning of the war. So many people from the eastern and central parts of the country fled to Lviv. Walk us through what happened here and what the situation's like right now. Yeah, Joe, well, right now the search is still continuing for any possible survivors in this big apartment building. It's about four stories tall, but is quite long. So search crews are still looking through the rubble, hoping to find people alive and bring them out alive. And you can see there in this drone footage just how catastrophic this missile strike was. The mayor saying in some cases the roofs were just completely blown off. And you can see that some 60 or 50 cars destroyed as well. Neighboring buildings were also damaged in this strike. It happened at about 1 o'clock in the morning. The Ukrainian military said that 10 ballistic missiles were fired from Russian positions in the Black Sea, at first heading north and then turning sharply west. Uh, seven of them were intercepted, but three unfortunately hit. And you see, you see the result there. At least four have been killed, confirmed dead so far. The youngest, a 21-year-old woman. The oldest, a 95-year-old woman. The mayor saying uh, she survived World War II, only to die in this Russian missile strike. And Sadly, Joe, the mayor does expect that that number of dead could rise. Joe. Just incredible. When we look at that video, we have to remember so many people living and working in Lviv right now. So what has been the reaction to this from both Ukraine and from Russia? Well, look, Ukraine once again is saying this is clearly a war crime. This is clearly a residential area. It's in the center of the city. It's an apartment building. Uh, President Zelensky said that, uh, gave his condolences, of course, to the victims, but also said that there will be a strong response uh, to Russia for this attack. We haven't heard from Russia regarding this particular attack yet, Joe, but typically what they say, and we've seen this time and again throughout the war, they say we don't strike civilian targets, despite what we're seeing here on our screens. Joe. Kelly, I also want to ask you about some exclusive reporting by NBC News. It focuses on secret talks that were held between former U.S. officials and the Russians about trying to bring the war to an end. What are we learning? Yeah, so this is exclusive reporting from my colleague Josh Letterman, and he's citing uh, about half a dozen people briefed on talks saying that a group of former U.S. top security officials are talking with people in Russia who have contact, are connected with the Kremlin, uh, trying to work out an end game, set up an end game for the war, laying the groundwork for possible discussions to end the war. Uh, we've asked a number of different officials for comment on this, including the White House's uh, top security officials. No comment from them. Russia's uh, embassy in Washington didn't respond to a comment. We did ask President Zelensky's office about this. They said, in general, uh, they don't comment on statements of anonymous sources about any alleged actions of anonymous people. They also said that their position in terms of negotiations hasn't changed, that any fate of Ukraine must be decided uh, by Ukraine. Joe. All right, Kelly uh, Kobe. By the way, expect more on Josh's incredible reporting coming up in the next hour. Yep, we'll talk with Josh next hour. Kelly Kobea in Kiev. Kelly, thank you so much. The U.S. Navy says it prevented 
prevented a Iranian warships from seizing two oil tankers in international waters near Oman. The incident happened early Wednesday morning, according to an American military official. Let's bring in NBC News global security reporter Dan DeLuce for more on this. Dan, good morning. So according to that official, Iranians appear to be attempting to board and take over the tanker before changing course when a U.S. Navy destroyer intervened. Explain to us what happened here. Why would Iran want to do this? That's right, Joe. Uh, this is not a new phenomenon. This has been going on for the past few years, but this was a, a fairly dramatic incident. And they tried to board two different oil tankers uh, in international waters near Oman. And one of those tankers is owned by Chevron. And in one of those cases, they, the Iranians actually opened fire on, that, on one of the tankers. Uh, no one was injured, but obviously that caused alarm. But in both cases, the a U.S. destroyer, the McFall, showed up on the scene, and the Iranians clearly had second thoughts and, and, and pulled away and were prevented from boarding those two tankers. But basically, Iran is, is often trying to flex its muscles in this part of the world. They want to send a signal that they can disrupt oil and commercial shipping in this really important waterway, Joe. And the U.S. has stepped up its presence and its patrols around the Strait of Hormuz to try to deter this kind of uh, interference. Dan, so what is Iran saying about this? What's their take on the course of events? They say they've done nothing wrong, and they allege that one of those tankers, the one owned by Chevron, had allegedly collided with an Iranian boat uh, this week and caused damage, and therefore they had a alleged court order from an Iranian court to seize that tanker. Uh, now, I don't think uh, the U.S. and a lot of other countries are going to recognize their authority in this, this uh, instance, and there's no independent confirmation that such a collision occurred. But that's their take. Uh, they always accuse the U.S. of, of kind of an imperial dominating behavior in the region. So, obviously, relations are horrendous between these two countries. Yeah, I want to ask you more about that. I mean, let's take a step back from this incident, big picture right now. Really, what is the state of relations between the U.S. and Iran right now? So, Joe, of course, no formal relations since 1979, since the hostage crisis way back then. But there are indirect negotiations going on right now. And the U.S. is trying to secure the release of Americans who have been held prisoner in Iran for several years now. And there's also... Uh, sort of indirect back-channel talks to try to somehow come to a verbal agreement that would prevent Iran from actually developing nuclear weapons. And there is some progress there on those fronts. And so the question is, are these incidents in the Gulf now going to derail those talks? And for whatever reason, Iran decided to perhaps take these actions to send some kind of a signal. So. I think we have to watch whether the diplomacy will unravel now or whether they can sort of control and contain those tensions in the Gulf. All right, Dan DeLuce, thank you so much as always. More international headlines now. In Mexico, dozens of people are dead after a passenger bus fell into a 75-foot deep gulch. NBC News foreign correspondent Megan Fitzgerald joins us from London with that and other world headlines. Megan, good morning. Ed, good morning to you. That's right. We start in Mexico where this bus crashed into a ravine and this all happened on Wednesday. Now, what we know is that 29 people have been killed, more than a dozen people injured. The bus driver appeared to have lost control. Now, Mexico just saw a deadly bus crash in April when 18 people died when a bus fell off a cliff. And in South Africa, at least 16 people dead there, including women and children, after a suspected gas leak. This happened in East Johannesburg. It's believed that the leak is linked to illegal gold mining in the area. Victims were found within a 300-foot radius of the scene. And guys, I'm sure you remember this video that went viral showing a tourist in Rome etching his name and his girlfriend's name on the wall of the Colosseum. The guy has been identified, he's lawyered up, and he wrote a letter to the Rome prosecutor's office, also to the mayor apologizing. He's asking for clemency here because this crime is punishable by up to five years in prison and a 15,000 euro.
fine, guys. People had some very strong words for that young man, so it'll be interesting to see what happens now that he's been identified. All right, Megan, thank you so much. Coming up, robbed in broad daylight, a troubling trend in a tourist hotspot. When we return, we're going to take you to San Francisco, where police are warning you could be the target of some especially bold thieves. And bad behavior in the front rows. Performers getting hit while performing on stage by their own fans. We're going to talk about it after the break. We are back with a closer look at an alarming series of crimes in the San Francisco area. Young men are smashing car windows in broad daylight and stealing from unsuspecting tourists. And in one neighborhood, mothers and caregivers think they are being targeted by a group of teen robbers. NBC News correspondent Valerie Castro has the details. The iconic San Francisco Park, famously seen in the opening credits of Full House, now the scene of a brazen crime. Shocking video shows a thief breaking into cars in broad daylight, leaving behind shattered car windows as eyewitnesses watch in disbelief and fear. All of us around, I could see people across everywhere, and we, we, I didn't do anything because I'm the kind that would go and do something. But at that point, I don't know if they have a gun. The victims, tourists visiting on vacation over the 4th of July, stopping for just a few minutes to snap a quick photo from Alamo Square. They don't understand the impact. Like, my child seat is on the side of the, of the car that they broke the window on. Now my son is going to sit there, and we have to worry about cleaning out every single little bit of glass. Two families left with stolen belongings, including a laptop, and both dealing with damaged rental cars. Just get valuable things that they see as valuable. They left our Starbucks bag. They left the wheelchair at least, but everything else they took. The smash and grabs the latest in a series of crimes plaguing the city. Robberies in San Francisco up almost 12% since last year, according to the police crime dashboard. In Noe Valley, considered a family-friendly neighborhood dubbed Stroller Valley, woman screams captured by home surveillance camera after she told NBC Bay Area she was attacked on her way to pick up her child from daycare last month. The victim asking that her identity be concealed. Somebody came at me from behind uh, and grabbed for my phone and I instinctively grabbed back which I don't recommend um, and he pushed me over forcefully to the ground. Video showing a hooded person running from the scene to a waiting car. Massive fear to does this guy have a weapon? Am I about to get seriously injured? Other women coming forward with similar stories. A San Francisco police captain saying at least 11 cases are under investigation and a group of juveniles are believed to be responsible, according to the local district supervisor's office. Residents believe the thieves are targeting moms and caretakers walking around the neighborhood, now anxious for police to make arrests. Valerie Castro, thank you so much. The district supervisor in Noe Valley tells us that at least one minor was arrested in connection with one of the cases, adding that police are still looking for more suspects. Well, from smash and grab to hurl and hurt, there is a troubling new trend at concerts, fans throwing objects or even assaulting performers during live shows. BB Rexa was treated at a hospital after a cell phone was thrown at her during a recent concert. Other singers, Kelsey Ballerini, Pink and Harry Styles, have all been hit by objects while on stage too. And singer Ava Max was actually slapped in the face by a concert goer. For more on this, we want to bring in Dr. Kristen Lieb. She is an associate professor in the marketing communications program at Emerson College. She is also the author of Gender, Branding, and the Modern Music Industry. Dr. Lieb, good to have you with us for this conversation. I mean, unfortunately, celebrities being attacked is nothing new, but it, it does seem to be happening more in these public spaces in ways that are really hard, I think, for us to wrap our brains around. What do you think this says about our relationship with artists? Is that relationship changing? Changing? I think uh, the relationship has been changing um, in a number of, of different ways that are distressing. I think um, we have 
seen audiences demanding more and more and more over time. If you think about even um, uh, the, the sort of rise of the streaming video, the tell-all video that now sort of every star has, and the sort of protective layer that used to exist between the artist and the fan seems to be eroding in different ways. Um, now up to the point where when they're doing their jobs and, and people have paid to go see them doing this thing that they're best at, fans are seeming to want to make the artist react to them rather than letting the artist sort of, you know, call the shots when they're on stage. You know, we saw a clip of the pink video there a moment ago. For those who don't know, a fan literally threw ashes from a relative who had passed away onto the stage. Just an unreal moment that even pink had a hard time understanding. Most of these incidents do seem to be happening to women. Your book focuses on the role that female pop stars play in the music world. I mean, and what role do you think gender is playing in all this? I think um, certainly men have things thrown at them as well. Um, but I think there are a few things going on. I think Number one, it's a way of checking women's power. It's saying don't get too comfortable with the power that you have. Um, you know, you know, stay on guard, right? Um, I think that's one thing. I think many men in particular are uncomfortable with very powerful women, and all of these women are very powerful. I think um, secondarily, um, there is no perceived threat that that person is probably going to respond in a violent way in the same way that a fan might have that kind of fear if it were if they were throwing you know something at a hetero normatively masculine man um, and the final thing is I think we have uh, as, as a collective audience demanded so much vulnerability of women that we don't women pop stars that we don't really know where the boundaries are anymore right you mentioned the role social media may have played in all this, and then we see the artists who are impacted by this taking to social media, talking about their experiences. Do you think that's an effective tool to discourage this type of behavior, or do you worry that it's having the opposite effect and maybe encouraging more people to do it? I mean, I think both things can be true at the same time. I mean, I think if you're someone who's receiving that on stage, it might be very difficult to say exactly what you want to say about that in the moment. I think many of us would be, uh, you know, sort of frozen or something if that were to happen uh, to us. So I think social media is a way of being able to make sure that the artists say what needs to be said about it from their standpoint. And it's also a good way of other artists supporting artists whom this has happened to. Um, but I do think that there is something going on with respect to fans getting confused about who the star is when they're at these performances, right? Like like a, a particular fan wants to be the star and so does something to make someone react in the moment, thus shifting the attention away from the star and onto the person who's done this incredibly antisocial thing in this social sort of community setting. Right. So I think it can be helpful, but I think it can also be, um, it can also um, sort of inspire people to continue on with the bad behavior and escalate and escalate and escalate in the hope of them getting their 15 minutes. All right. Professor Lieb, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. Bottom line, just stop throwing stuff at people, everyone. Exactly. All right. Thank so you much. so much. Coming up, rallying for renters. Up next, we're going to introduce you to a group that is fighting back against one corporate landlord to take back homes for those who need them. And Meta ruffling feathers with its latest release. We're going to tell you about the new rival to Twitter that's out now after launching one day early. This is Morning News Now. Welcome back. We've been telling you about how some large companies are buying up single family homes and renting them out. Well, it can provide an essential housing option. It isn't always beneficial to the renter. NBC News business and data reporter Brian Chung introduces us to a group that's taking a stand against one of the country's largest corporate landlords demanding better. You would Jamari Brown moved into this home in North Minneapolis in 2020. We've had rats and roaches for three years. She showed us busted locks, where the basement leaks after it snows, and crumbling walls. That's all you got to do. Brown says she complained, but that her landlord, Progress Residential, brushed her off, and she can't afford to move elsewhere. So what's it take for the landlord to come and fix these issues? For this house to explode and us to die. 
being honest. Brown is getting help from United Renters for Justice. And we need change now. The nonprofit has been fighting to improve living conditions for some of the roughly 600 progress renters in Minnesota. Tenants have won repairs, compensation, one-year rent freezes, and, in the case of Shanika Henderson, the chance to move into a newly renovated home. These pictures of her previous progress home show the poor conditions outside and inside. It had mold in the basement, probably about this thick, about two inches thick, that set in on the walls from the windows and everything. The mother of four says she is finally at peace in her new home with progress. And it's everything that I ever imagined. I can see this me in my forever home, even though I am still a renter, but my family is safe. Progress Residential is one of the largest providers of single family rental homes in the United States, operating with more than 85,000 homes in 22 states. Renters of Progress Homes in other states have told NBC News about similar issues to those we saw in Minneapolis, alleging that serious problems were either inadequately addressed or ignored entirely. In Minnesota, Attorney General Keith Ellison last year sued Havenbrook Homes and Progress Residential, alleging a deliberate and calculated strategy to extract ever greater profits from their tenants by severely under-maintaining their homes. We cannot let a, a, a company, a hedge fund or a private equity firm, get to a point where they can move the market. His lawsuit also included Predium Partners, the private equity firm tied to Havenbrook and Progress. Owners and operators, all of them are responsible and they will be held responsible. So it's not going to be good enough to say, I, I just own the place and get the profits from it. I don't operate. No, so that's not going to work. Uh, we expect everybody to operate ethically and within the law. Predium declined to comment for this story. In a statement, Progress did not address the issues raised by the Minneapolis tenants, but told NBC News, many millions have been invested in the properties we manage in Minnesota. And in court, the company denies the allegation that tenants had to wait an inordinately long time for repairs. But now Henderson hopes her success inspires other Progress renters. I want to put power into these families to let them know, stand up, speak out for yourself. Helping tenants like Jamari Brown find her voice. We got to keep beating the door down on them. And push for better conditions, one fix at a time. Brian Chung, NBC News, Minneapolis. Financial headlines now, and Meta has officially thrown its Twitter competitor Threads into the ring. And so far, it's looking like it might be a knockout. CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us with that. Silvana, I love how we're using all these fight analogies now that we know that Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk want to have a cage match. I, you know, I, I, if they do, if they do, Joe, I'm paying for that, okay? Yeah, I'm paying to so, watch yeah. it. <laughs> All right, let me get you some let me get you some business headlines. I'm gonna start with this. A pair of authors are suing ChatGPT maker OpenAI. Now they allege their copyrighted books were used to train the chatbot without their consent. Paul Tremblay, that's he's the author of The Cabin at the End of the World, and Mona Awad, who wrote Bunny, say ChatGPT generates a very accurate summaries of their work, which would only be possible if it's trained on the text, which violates copyright law. OpenAI hasn't responded to CNBC's request for comment. Nearly three quarters of Americans say they're not fully financially secure. A new survey from Bankrate finds of that group, a quarter expect they'll never be secure. People say the economy is holding them back and they point to high inflation, the current climate, and rising interest rates. To feel secure, Americans say they'd have to earn on average $233,000 a year. To feel rich, they believe they'd have to earn an average of $483,000 a year, Joe. All right, Silvana, thank you so much. Appreciate yeah. it. So millions of us now have a new social media option after Mark Zuckerberg's launched Meta's text-based app, Threads. A company spokesperson says more than 10 million people had signed up within the first seven hours. The app is considered direct competition for Twitter, which is owned by Zuckerberg's rival, Elon Musk. Now, Twitter users have recently been voicing their frustrations following a series of unpopular changes to the platform. Let's bring in Joanna Stern for more on this. She is an NBC News personal technology technology analyst and the senior personal technology columnist at the Wall Street Journal. Joanna, good morning. So, I mean, Threads is closely tied to Meta's Instagram. For instance, your username is the same on both. What's the strategy here and what's the reaction so far? 
Well, the strategy is a good one. If you're going to take on Twitter, well, leverage your other or your really current existing user base. And that's exactly what Meta is doing. They're taking their existing user base of Instagram and saying, hey, if you sign into this app, you can use your username. You can follow all the people you're already following on Instagram and all of them are going to be there and they're going to be chatting. So come, come join us. So how is Zuckerberg looking to fill some of these major gaps that were created at Twitter following the Musk takeover? Is this at all comparable to Twitter or is it something that well, at least Zuckerberg sees as surpassing the original text-based social media giant? This seems, it seems to be the mission here, obviously, to take on Twitter, but to also in, in, in the way that they are framing it, meta executives seem to be framing it, is a more sane or a, a more uh, collegial place to hang out online. And that the, sort of combating the fact that Twitter has become overrun with a lot of commentary about politics, about Elon Musk himself. This is meant to be a bit of a haven for those that are looking for that more, I don't know, old school use of social media. Is, does this feel like something that people actually want right now? I mean, is it just, okay, fewer people are interested in Twitter, therefore they want a replacement for it? Or is this entire concept something that, that people kind of want to move on from as they're more interested in videos and pictures and things we see on Instagram and TikTok? I think it's a combination of both. Absolutely, there are a number of Twitter users that have been yearning for something that is not Twitter, that is not a platform owned by Elon Musk with this set of controversial changes Musk has made. Then there is this other set of people that are coming from Instagram who may not have actually been using Twitter. And that's where I think Meta has a real opportunity. And when I think about what Meta and Mark Zuckerberg is, are really trying to do here is they're trying to capture more time. That is what is the most valuable currency on social media. If we are spending our time elsewhere, if it is Twitter, if it is TikTok, then Meta loses. So throw in another app into the mix. We're already spending time on Instagram. Now we may spend more time on threads and maybe we go back to also spending some time on old school Facebook. Yeah, that is an interesting point. The Instagram user who was never on Twitter. I didn't think about that. So, so threads has launched in more than 100 countries, but it is yet to launch in the EU. That's because of privacy and personal data concerns. What is it they're worried about? And should American users have any concerns about privacy? Yes, I spoke to Meta's VP of product about this yesterday. Why is it in the EU? They said there are some other regulatory concerns there and they're making sure that they can launch there safely and, and uh, avoid any regulatory concerns. When I looked at the privacy policy and when I asked Meta about this, I really don't think there's much here that's different than what has been when, in terms of data and data usage than what you see in Instagram. Meta is saying that they are following two privacy policies here, the original Meta one, and there is a new tailored one to threads. But that has to do a little bit more with the fact that they are embracing a more open source, decentralized protocol with this new threads app, which is a bit complicated. We won't necessarily get into that right now. But people should remember, this is Meta. This is the company that has learned how to suck up our data and feed us tailored advertising based on it. All right, a good reminder there. Joanna Stern, interested to see what happens in the coming days and weeks with this one. Thanks so much. Coming up, the sound of hope. When we come back, how one conductor in a crime-ridden town is using music to change the lives of hundreds of kids. You're watching Morning News Now. All right, so if you eat, sleep, and breathe all things Disney, you are in luck. More than 1,500 rare collectibles are up for auction in Burbank, California. That includes animated ghosts from the Haunted Mansion. That's cool. Birds from the Enchanted Tiki Room. Even a car from the Dumbo Ride. One of the biggest items is a 1917 Model T moving van from Disneyland Main Street. It all comes from toy collector Joel McGee. He's known as the Toy Scout and has been amassing Disney items for 30 years, Van Eaton Galleries is holding the auction later this month. Finally, this hour, a message of hope from kids in a border city that's known for its violence. NBC News Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent Andrea Mitchell introduces us to a remarkable conductor in Juarez, Mexico, who's transforming the lives of hundreds of children, helping them escape the dangers of their city while also reaching for their dreams. Across the border in the heart of Juarez, Mexico, a bus goes house to house, picking up children after school, transporting them to a different world. Yes, 
At this after-school program, children aged 7 to 18 from both Juarez and El Paso coming together, getting music lessons 15 hours a week on donated instruments, playing songs like The Impossible Dream, teaching them life lessons about dreams they can achieve through teamwork and discipline. Asiel playing the cello helped him overcome the grief when his father died from COVID. It was like a, a way to put all my sadness, angry, everything. My father loved to me to play, so now uh, I play like he's listening to me. For many of these kids, music has provided a sanctuary. The program, the brainchild of conductor Jove Garcia, started in 2008 when Juarez was overtaken by drugs and street gangs, then known as the murder capital of the world. They had 500 students in Juarez until the pandemic when they lost government funding and all but shut down, now struggling to rebuild with private funds, bringing music back to the kids. The gangs, they start doing uh, drugs, drinking, and even get, getting killed. So I think the, the, the most important thing of this program is that we're saving lives. Music saves lives. Music is helping bring down the barriers between many of the children here and the children of El Paso and the rest of the world. With music as the universal language, with passion you can hear. It's truly amazing because here in the theaters we see people that come from El Paso, from Chihuahua, from over here locally. And it's truly amazing, you know, being able to share culture musically in a stage like this one. Reaching across borders, making their dreams possible. Andrea Mitchell, NBC News, Juarez. Music. Music saves lives. Love that message. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. The news continues right now. Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. Savannah is on assignment. Right now on Morning News Now, summer swelter. It is shaping up to be another hot one out there for millions of Americans from the deep south all the way out west as triple digit temperatures turn deadly. All as the holiday travel rush heats up again with many travelers now heading home after the long weekend. We've got your full forecast in just a moment. Peace talks. We've got some breaking news this morning, and it's an NBC News exclusive. Several top former U.S. officials are now reportedly in secret talks with the Russians trying to lay the groundwork to potentially end the war in Ukraine. We've got much more on that coming up. Also this morning, the results are in, and that mysterious white substance found inside the White House over the weekend has now been confirmed to be cocaine. That's according to lab tests. What we know this morning on the investigation investigation into how it got there. Finally, this morning, Downward Dog Dreams, we're going to introduce you to the nine-year-old who's working hard this summer to become a registered yoga teacher. Looking forward to that conversation. This morning, people all around the world are going to deal with that brutal heat once again. It is hitting historic levels. The average global temperature spiked Monday to a record high of 62.6 degrees. Then on Tuesday, the world's record heat climbed even higher to 62.9 degrees. And the University of Maine says the global temp remained at that record high yesterday. States like Florida and Connecticut have activated extreme weather plans to help people stay safe safe in the face of these dangerous temperatures. NBC News correspondent Priscilla Thompson is in Houston with more on this relentless heat. Priscilla, good morning. Joe, good morning. I've got two words for you, hot and humid. It is going to be another scorcher here in Houston, and families will undoubtedly be flocking to parks like this one to try to get the kids out of the house for the summer while also staying cool amid this deadly heat. An astonishing milestone this week. Monday and Tuesday, the hottest days ever recorded on Earth. Here in the U.S., Americans feeling the brutal summer heat firsthand. Over 20 million under heat alerts today. It's really hot, really humid. Central Florida reaching a triple-digit heat index Wednesday. It's too hot. I want to move out of Florida. My body's not made for this type of weather. Local emergency managers putting extreme weather plans in place. Just last year, we activated the plan twice, and it was only for a couple days. It's now been active for over a week. 
Connecticut's governor also activating statewide extreme weather protocols to protect residents from brutal temperatures. Sarasota, El Paso and Portland all seeing record highs Wednesday. And in Tucson, Arizona, it was a staggering 107 degrees. Summer's only just begun. Always parks that have sprinklers. We carry a lot of water. We spray them down all day. <laughs> but the sweltering heat is already in full force. Drinking a lot of Gatorade. Water, staying hydrated. And temps still spiking with that global record. Even with half the world in winter, the average global temperature at 62.6 degrees Monday and even higher, 62.9 on Tuesday. Climate experts warning this is not a milestone to celebrate. We're pushing our ecosystems and our climate into a different place uh, than it's been for the entirety of human civilization. And that is alarming. All as Americans are bracing for more historically hot days ahead this summer. And overnight, we did learn of another heat-related death, this one in Death Valley. And I should point out, it's not just heat that we're concerned about today. There are also 24 million Americans under dangerous air quality alerts across the Northeast and the Midwest. But a bit of good news, we are expecting more seasonal temperatures heading into the weekend. So hopefully folks can get out and enjoy. Joe. All right, Priscilla, thanks so much. Let's talk more about the forecast and bring in meteorologist Michelle Grossman. Michelle, good morning. Good morning, Joe. Great to see you. And we're going to still see that heat continuing in portions of the southwest. The Pacific Northwest doing a little bit better today. And then other spots in Florida are going to see temperatures above average into the 90s. You factor in the humidity and it's going to feel more like over 100 degrees. The northeast, too, some spots will be into the mid 90s and that's going to break some records as well. So this is what it looks like today. We're talking about uh, the heat. We're also talking about severe weather once again. The bullseye for the severe weather will be in the central plains and northern high, high, uh, high plains into portions in the mid Mississippi Valley. And then in addition to that, out ahead of this front, we're looking at some heavy rain in portions of the Gulf Coast states into the southeast. We could see some very slow moving storms that could drop a lot of rain in some spots, and that's going to lead to some flash flooding. But starting with the heat, we still have 20 million people impacted by heat alerts, whether it's a heat advisory that's in the orange or an excessive heat warning that is in the pink. That includes Phoenix, also Tucson, temperatures over 110 in some spots. And then we have heat advisories in parts of the, uh, parts of the northeast where we're going to see temperatures into the upper 90s. Same story in parts of Florida where we're going to see temperatures into the upper 90s feeling more like over 100 degrees. But there's a huge temperature divide. So we have this cold front that's lingering over the area that's triggering those storms in the plains into the mid Mississippi Valley. But look behind this. We're getting this plume of cooler air from Canada and that's bringing temperatures well below normal in some spots in the Midwest and Northern Plains. Minneapolis today, 77 degrees. That's six degrees below what is typical for this time of year. 78 in Chicago, below average. And this is going to move off to the east. So we're going to start to see, as Priscilla just mentioned, the temperatures come down a bit out ahead of this front. Not today, though. We're looking at 91 in Charleston. We're looking at New York City, 90 degrees, 94 in Burlington. The heat index of 96. Notice tomorrow we still have some hot spots. We're looking at temperatures into the 80s in Bangor, Maine, 89 in Hartford, but not quite as hot. And then this front's going to move through by the week. Weekend. And we're going to be more seasonal as we go throughout the weekend. So Albany, a nice 84 degrees, 81 on Monday. New York City feeling really good by next Monday, 83 degrees. So we still have a couple days of some really hot weather there. Now, the air quality, Priscilla mentioned this too, 24 million at risk. Notice the map, though. We were talking about unhealthy levels, very unhealthy levels just a week ago, week and a half ago. We're talking moderate levels. So still dangerous if you're out and about for a long time or maybe you have some respiratory issues, but not quite as bad. But still 24 million at risk. Need, need to be careful if you do have those respiratory issues. Now, here's that cold front. It's a long one. It's slow moving. We're looking at storms right along this front. Some could be really strong with some damaging winds up to 75 miles per hour, also some hail. But along that front, we're going to see some really heavy rainfall as well. That could lead to flash flooding. All right. You know, keep an eye on it. And I like that you said the word seasonable. That sounds, that sounds good. I like uh -huh. that. Bring on the seasonable weather. We deserve it. Exactly. It's time. No kidding. All right. Thanks, Michelle. <laughs> sure. Appreciate it. So the impact from the extreme summer weather is still being felt by travelers. On Wednesday, more than 69 
900 flights were delayed. Nearly 500 flights were canceled all across the country. That's according to the flight tracker FlightAware. You can see nearly 7,000 flights delayed, nearly 500 canceled. These travel disruptions come as the July 4th holiday period broke records for travel. NBC News correspondent Shaq Brewster joins us now from O'Hare Airport with the latest. Shaq, good morning. So I realize it's Thursday, but we're just going to say this is part of a very, very long holiday weekend. That includes yesterday where right. O'Hare experienced hundreds of delays because of these severe thunderstorms. How are things looking now? Well, Joe, things are looking far improved. You can see behind me, it is certainly busy at O'Hare Airport. A lot of travel is here, but things are going fairly smoothly. People being processed fairly quickly. And, you know, you mentioned those storms, those wicked storms that we saw overnight. That really had an impact here at Chicago's O'Hare Airport, where you saw one out of every three departing flights leaving late. It led the nation in uh, flights that were canceled and flights that were delayed. You mentioned na nationwide. Yesterday, we saw nearly 7,000 flights canceled, nearly 500 delayed. Looking at the numbers this morning, those numbers are far improved. About 600 delays so far, fewer than 100 cancellations. It's still early, but if you follow that trend and compare it to what we've seen earlier this week, we're looking at numbers that are far better than what we've been seeing for much of this holiday travel crunch. You know, Shaq, these travel disruptions, despite them, the July 4th holiday period still broke a lot of travel records. What can you tell us about that? Yeah. Breaking all sorts of records. It's like, which record do you want to talk about? We're at airport, so let's start there. We had AAA saying that uh, there was a record amount of travelers projected. We know that the TSA confirmed that when we saw last Friday, the TSA screened more passengers than ever before, breaking their 2019 Thanksgiving record with travelers who are going through airports. If you look at the roads, you're talking about another record, about 43 million Americans taking it to the roads for this July 4th holiday. Uh, the good news there is that the peak travel has ended. So we know the peak was yesterday afternoon and yesterday evening and then last Friday. We are now beyond that, but experts are saying even if you're hitting the road, don't let up, still use those traffic apps, still shop around for gas prices. We know gas prices, the average is about $1.25 less than it was at this point last year, Joe. And Shaq, for some of those folks, some of who might be behind you right now, been impacted by these delays and cancellations, they're frustrated. How are airlines yeah. offering to help them out? A few different ways. We know it was around this point last week where you saw massive delays from United Airlines. Well, that company offering flight, uh, uh, flyers about 30,000 uh, miles for uh, people who were disrupted, who got their, delayed, their trips delayed either overnight or who were stranded and never made it to their destinations. But, you know, if you look at Nationwide and if you look at the major airlines, most airlines offer some sort of assistance if your flight is delayed three hours or beyond in terms of meal vouchers. If you are stranded overnight, most major airlines offer some sort of hotel accommodations. The tip that travel experts uh, suggest you use is that government website, flightrights.gov, and that'll tell you specifically what your airline offers when you end up uh, in some travel trouble, Joe. Okay, Shaq Brewster at O'Hare. Shaq, thanks so much. An unusual drama is playing out at the White House. That is where an investigation is underway to figure out who brought a small bag of cocaine into the West Wing. A Secret Service official said the substance was found by officers during routine patrols in a highly trafficked part of the White House. For the latest on this, we're joined by White House correspondent Mike Memoli. So, Mike, clearly this is an unusual situation. Do we know now where these drugs are and what is the latest on the investigation? So after this small plastic baggie was discovered on Sunday night, there was an initial test by D.C. fire personnel uh, to have an initial test of positive of cocaine. It was then brought to a federal lab by the Secret Service for a more conclusive test. And we learned yesterday that it did in indeed confirm that it was cocaine. One of the more interesting details that we learned is that it remains at that federal lab so they can look for things like potential DNA evidence, fingerprints, other uh, chemical evidence that might indicate who brought this into the West Wing. We also know that the Secret Service is reviewing visitor logs. They're looking through some camera footage of this location uh, to try to get a better sense of how many and which people were coming through to try to narrow that scope. But we're also told that because this was such a small bag, 
There might not be enough forensic data there to identify who it was, but the Secret Service is indicating this could be an investigation that stretches on weeks, not just days. You know, Mike, this was found in what's being described as a high traffic area. I know you've been to that area before. So, so describe what it's like to walk through the West Wing lobby. So, Joe, this is not like the famous TV show of the West Wing, where there always seem to be, you know, steady streams of people walking and talking through the hallways. But there are dozens of people who come into this entrance lobby uh, during the course of the day, official guests, but also some tourists and visitors uh, who might be asked to leave some of their belongings, a wallet, a phone. Uh, in a cubby if they're going to especially more sensitive areas of the West Wing, like the Situation Room or even the Oval Office. And so that's why there is really intense scrutiny of the uh, footage from this area and also those logs, because one of the big questions is just how long had this baggie been there uh, before it was discovered? Was it over the course of a holiday weekend in which it was mainly tourists, uh, guests of White House staff coming through? Or would this have been potentially going back even further working days in which much more uh, official visitors like members of Congress, uh, other government officials from outside the White House would have been coming through? That'll be a big part of the equation here. Of course, in the West Wing talk show, people are always walking and talking. That's right. So, Mike, if investigators determine who the drugs belong to, is that actually going to become public since this is a Secret Service investigation? Yeah, that's a very big question. One of the reasons why we thought it was so interesting that the White House itself said that they weren't at this point conducting their own separate investigation. They're completely deferring to the Secret Service. I asked Karine Jean-Pierre during the briefing yesterday, is that Secret Service investigation simply about the facts trying to determine whether some security protocols were sufficient or potentially violated in this case? Or is this about ultimately finding somebody criminally responsible and referring them for prosecution? She would not answer that question. She did confirm, of course, that White House officials are subject to uh, regular drug testing. The results of those drug tests, we never learned them publicly, of course. But given that this has become such a distraction for the White House, if they are able to determine who it is, they may have an interest in revealing at least that that was determined, if not the name of the individual who was responsible. All right, we'll see what happens. Mike Memoli, thank you so much. A New York teenage surfer is recovering this morning after getting bit by a shark. This is the latest in a string of incidents with numerous shark sightings, shark sightings around the country. They're leaving many beachgoers on edge, many lifeguards on high alert. NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa joins us now from Robert Moses State Park on Long Island with the latest. Emily, good morning. Hey there. Well, this is what everyone's been talking about all week. The recent rash of incidents has lifeguards ramping up patrols from the air to the sea to the ground and urging people to use caution and common sense before entering the water. They also have ramped up drone patrols, which captured dozens of sand sharks lingering just about 200 yards from where I'm standing earlier this week. If you're among the millions of people flocking to the shores, experts say it's important to keep in mind that yeah, the ocean is full of a wide array of sea life, including including sharks, and we are merely visitors. Here they come. Oh my gosh. From the Gulf Shore to beaches in the Northeast, <laughs> a recent string of shark sightings and encounters have holiday beachgoers and lifeguards on high alert. I'm going to need you to respond for a 10 shark attack at the lifeguard station. 15-year-old Peter Bancoli telling News 12 Long Island he felt something sharp while he was out surfing early Monday evening off Long Island's Kismet Beach. My first reaction to when the shark grabbed my foot was to immediately get out the water and get help. Bancoli says he got back to shore where a friend and another beachgoer helped him until medics arrived. He's now using a scooter to get around as his foot heals. His encounter, just one of a handful of suspected or confirmed shark bites this week. We don't go out too far because I know they're coming close, but we're still swimming. In Florida, a photographer with our Palm Beach station captured this shark swimming just offshore. It comes a day after another shark got too close for comfort for some swimmers at a beach on the panhandle. No one hurt in either incident. Experts say increased shark sightings this time of year are normal, in large part because more people are in the water. It's not that there's a good chance that there are sharks in there. There are sharks in the ocean. The ocean is their home. The ocean is a wild place. It is not a swimming pool. Dr. Bob Pewter, the chief scientist at OSEARCH, a nonprofit that tags and tracks hundreds of sharks, says along with shark populations starting to rebound in recent years, it may seem like encounters are happening more because of social media. 
Dr. Huter also cautions even when sharks bite, it's often by mistake. Everybody understands the difference between a dog bite and a dog attack. A shark attack, though, which implies that the shark is really trying to, to kill and feed on the person, that is so incredibly rare. Back on Long Island, Peter Bancoli won't let his injury prevent him from getting back on his board. It's very excited. Go back and start shredding again, you know? So for those who maybe are a little more nervous about going back and shredding again, Emily, what should people keep in mind as they are heading to beaches this summer? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, Joe. Well, the most important thing to keep in mind is that we are not the target for sharks. They're looking for fish and seals. So going back to that common sense, if you see that kind of marine life, you want to swim in the opposite direction. Also, avoid wearing flashy jewelry that a shark may mistake for a fish. And in the very rare occasion that a shark does swim close to you, don't panic. Just calmly make your way back to the shore. Joe? Easy to say, harder to actually do in the moment. All right, Emily, thank you so much. Appreciate it. A new law in New York City is requiring businesses that use artificial intelligence when hiring new employees to prove that it was free from sexism and racism. NBC News cybersecurity reporter Kevin Collier joins us now to explain how this first in the nation law is designed. Good to have you with us. So how do regulators even plan to check for bias in these programs and what should we know about this software? So you got to remember this is a very early first of its kind law. So what, you, what they do is you have to, a business that's using the software, you just use a third party auditor. And they don't, the ones I've spoken with, they don't crack open the code. They don't look for you know, evidence of racism in the, in the ones and zeros. They just run it and they see if it is unfair to people of a certain race, if it's unfair to women. Um, and if they don't pass, they, in theory, are not allowed to use it for hiring. Got it. So I know there's concern that the audits don't go far enough with addressing ageism, ableism. Mm -hmm. What are some of the other concerns here? Well, it, there's no other kinds of discrimination besides race or gender. Uh, but beyond that, there's also not like much idea that it's uh, employers are going to uh, uh, comply with this. There are civil penalties involved if you, uh, in theory, don't go uh, start using one of these audits. Uh, but some law firms are saying that, you know, you're telling their, their, their clients that they don't have to actually go along with it. They don't have to publish the results. They don't have to comply. So we'll see if a judge actually enforces this. Yeah, so if, if they don't comply, what happens? And if, and also if bias is found, if they do comply and then bias is found, what's the possible punishment there? Pretty vague. Civil penalties, but really it's going to have to be decided in courts because this is the first time anything like this is, has been implemented. You know, Congress keeps talking about let's regulate AI. This is the first little bit of that that we're seeing. Do we get a sense that a lot of businesses are doing this right now or are looking into using AI for their hiring processes? Some estimates are more than half the employers in the United States are using AI to some degree to screen candidates. I mean, you got to realize this is a response to how many job seekers are automating their job application process. And it makes it really difficult for companies that are hiring to sift through them all. All right. Kevin Collier, thanks so much for your reporting. Appreciate it. Coming up on this hour of Morning News Now, the online revival of a former weight loss titan, the big name backer that is giving Jenny Craig a second chance. But first, an NBC News exclusive, the secret talks between former U.S. officials and Russians that could potentially change the course of the war in Ukraine. We've got all that and more coming up. Stay with us. We're back with some exclusive reporting by NBC News about the war in Ukraine. We've learned that a group of former U.S. officials held secret talks with the Russians back in April about bringing the conflict to an end. That's according to a group of former and current officials who were briefed on those discussions. NBC News foreign correspondent Josh Letterman broke this story, he joins us now. Josh, good to have you with us. So walk us through what you've learned about this meeting. Who was involved? What was discussed? Well, Joe, in addition to Russia's top diplomat, Sergei Lavrov, this meeting included several former U.S. officials with deep experience uh, from their time at the State Department, the White House, and the Pentagon, dealing not only with Russia and the former Soviet Union, but also uh, with European issues. It also included uh, Richard Haas, who's the outgoing president of the Council on Foreign Relations, a very prominent uh, face of American foreign policy expertise. And we're told uh, that on the agenda for this meeting was really 
finding potential off-ramps to the war in Ukraine, discussing what the reactions might be in Moscow and Washington to potential uh, ways to move the war into uh, ultimately peace talks that could bring an end to the hostilities. And we're told that this is one high-level example of this type of back-channel diplomacy that has been going on for some time now, uh, involving former U.S. officials and Russians perceived to be close to the Kremlin, uh, trying to really feel out potential solutions and engage in the kinds of conversations that are hard for the governments right now to have directly. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, what's key here is these are private citizens, not in government. It's also known as track two diplomacy. Right. How common is this type of negotiation? Why was it preferred in this case? Well, we should point out that these negotiations are not happening uh, on behalf of the Biden administration. The White House is aware that these private citizens, as you pointed out, are having these discussions. They were briefed after that meeting with Lavrov in New York uh, by the participants in that meeting about just what went on. But these citizens are doing this really on their own. And that tends to be the whole purpose of Track 2 diplomacy, is that when you have private citizens who can sort of pass information to the government uh, about what they're hearing, uh, there are sometimes more flexibility when you have this informal, casual discussions than when you've got two governments sitting across the table for each other. Sometimes it's actually more difficult to break away from your talking points and really get to the meat of what potential solutions to tricky diplomatic issues could be. And so that uh, is what these former U.S. officials are trying to do, really test the waters for potential solutions that could later be brought to track one to direct uh, negotiations involving Russia, the United States, and of course the government of Ukraine. So still, Josh, we understand not everyone in the diplomatic and national security communities approved of this meeting. Why was it so divisive? Well, the concern here, Joe, is that this could undercut the Biden administration's longstanding mantra of nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine, right? A lot of uh, former officials and foreign policy experts have raised concerns about whether this at least creates the appearance of uh, the U.S. or its intermediaries and Russia in the back room cutting deals that Ukraine is not directly involved in. And in fact, Ukrainian officials have responded to our reporting uh, saying that they, too, are, have that concern, that they don't want to see uh, anybody discussing Ukraine uh, at a table where they do not have a seat. And so uh, the concern is whether that could potentially undermine Ukraine's ultimate leverage in peace talks uh, as the U.S. and its allies are really starting to show that they are eager for this war to move into a different phase where we're actually talking about peace negotiations by the end of the year, Joe. All right. Great reporting. Josh, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. This morning, there are some big question marks about the whereabouts of the head of the Russian mercenary Wagner Group. Evgeny Prigozhin had gone to Belarus as part of a deal brokered by the president of that country following last month's aborted Moscow mutiny. But the president of Belarus said today that Prigozhin is now back in Russia. NBC News chief international correspondent Keir Simmons has more. This morning at his presidential palace, international journalists questioning the president of Belarus Alexander Lukashenko, for the first time since he says he helped Russia avoid a civil war. The authoritarian leader brokering a truce between President Putin and mercenary leader Yevgeny Prigozhin. Lukashenko offering Prigozhin exile in his country. But after almost two weeks, mystery still surrounds that deal. Where is he this morning? He could have gone to Moscow or maybe somewhere else. But he is not on the territory of Belarus. Prigozhin has been heard, but not seen. Only releasing unverified audio These images, released by the Russian news outlet Izvestia, appear to show Prigozhin's house in St. Petersburg, searched by Russian police. There's a prayer room, guns and fake passports, and a sledgehammer resting against the wall. NBC News cannot confirm whether the images are authentic. We flew to Belarus over the Caspian Sea. Well, I just arrived in Belarus, a country that still has a KGB. Yet, I just walked through without any questions. President Lukashenko clearly wants to talk to us. On the drive to Minsk, posters celebrate the Belarus International Security Services, but there are no visible mentions of the Wagner mercenary group. These satellite images, released by the Associated Press, appear to show a camp being built at a former military base here. NBC News has not been able to verify the images or what the base is being used for. The suggestion that they will be used to house Prigozhin's soldiers. 
But while in 2020, President Putin helped President Lukashenko crush protests and stay in power, and Amnesty International says freedom in the small communist country is still severely curtailed with opposition and journalists jailed. Some people we spoke to are open about their opposition to Prigozhin moving to their country. Bad. Sure. Don't like Ev it. Everyone feels the same, mm. but maybe afraid to tell this. President Lukashenko, described by some, uh, described by some, uh, Joe, as the last dictator uh, in Europe, had to say at his presidential palace that he invited to us to here in Belarus and to other international news organizations will mystify many around the world uh, because he said the leader, Yevgeny Prigozhin, of that mutiny in Russia is still in Russia, is a free man, and he even suggested that Prigozhin and his Wagner forces may never move here to Belarus. Joe? All right, Keir Simmons reporting from Belarus. Thank you so much. Coming up, we are digging into a troubling health headline this morning. Deaths from pregnancy here in America are still on the rise, doubling, in fact, in the last 20 years. So who is most at risk and what exactly is behind this troubling trend? We've got the answers next. This is Morning News Now. We're back with alarming new data on maternal deaths in the United States. Researchers say the number of people dying in America from pregnancy-related causes has doubled in the last 20 years. And what's even more concerning, we're seeing the highest maternal death rates among black women. Maternal deaths among black women have also doubled over the last 20 years. That's according to a joint study between Mass General Brigham and the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington. Dr. Allison Bryant joins us now. She is the Senior Medical Director for Health Equity at Mass General Brigham and the co-lead author of this study. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us on this important topic. So in addition to the spike in maternal death rates among women, the study also notes a sharp increase in American Indian and Alaskan Native deaths in several states. I mean, this really echoes so much of what we've been hearing about in recent years with research. But first of all, why are we seeing this spike? Yeah, I think it's multifactorial. There are lots of reasons, and part of it is that we do have an aging pregnant population, but really I think we need to sort of look at policies and things like structural racism that may be contributing to inequities in care. So are individuals able to be at their most healthy entering pregnancy? What kind of care do they receive? Is that care high quality? Is it equitable? And really, I think importantly, in the period of time after pregnancy, how are we monitoring uh, individuals' health and health outcomes um, during that period of time? time. So this study found maternal death rates just as a whole are unacceptably high in the United States. What risk factors are being attributed to these attributed to these maternal deaths? So again, there are things like increasing age. So we know that um, individuals who are older are more likely to have other health conditions, but there certainly has also been a rise in chronic health conditions. But I really would sort of point again to the fact that health care is not the only driver of health. And so things like policies that affect health, affect things like what we call social determinants or structural determinants of health are also so inequitably distributed and we are not paying enough attention to what do individuals need to most achieve their sort of healthiest selves. So let's talk about policies. You also mentioned, mentioned structural racism, but what are some of the things that we can do, some of the policy changes that you would like to see to help address this health crisis? So I think one of the most important things is making sure that all individuals have equitable access to high quality care. And particularly, I think, in the postpartum or post-pregnancy period. So, for example, many states have chosen to expand Medicaid or public health insurance after delivery for up to 12 months. And so I think that that's incredibly important. So for an individual that's had high blood pressure at the end of pregnancy, if they lose their insurance coverage several weeks after pregnancy, there's not as much that we'll be able to do to keep them healthy either prior to a next pregnancy or in that period of time. I also think it's really important that we sort of focus on healthcare providers and the institutions and make sure that we proceed with anti-racism training, making sure that individuals are aware of the differential ways that they may care for individuals that may affect trust and access and ultimately outcomes. Do you feel like we're in a place right now where things can move in a better direction or do you worry things could actually get worse from here? 
Yeah, I think if you look at the work that we've done, it looks like there actually was starting to be a bit of a plateau for many racial and ethnic groups, with the exception of American Indian Alaska Natives. So it's possible that some of the work that we had put into maternal mortality and prevention was starting to show some benefit. We know that the pandemic certainly sort of exacerbated um, the issue. And so if we look at CDC data and sort of combine that with what we have found, I do have concerns that we certainly have moved in the wrong direction in the past couple of years. And it's going to be, take a lot of work to undo um, do the harms. All right. Dr. Allison Bryant, thank you for everything you do. And thank you for taking some time to join us this morning and talk about this. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. The Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department is investigating and has removed two deputies from duty after they used force on a female shoplifting suspect at a grocery store last month. NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer has the latest. Good morning. Video of that arrest has gone viral after a police officer violently took down a woman described as a senior citizen. The sheriff now calling that video disturbing. No, you can't touch Stop. me. You can't Stop. touch me. This violent takedown by a Los Angeles sheriff's deputy sparking a probe after an unidentified woman was tackled and pepper sprayed, leaving witnesses in shock. Oh, no. Uh uh. Shortly after video of the arrest went viral, the LA Sheriff's Department released body camera footage. The sheriff calling the video disturbing and reassigning the two deputies involved pending an investigation. This investigation is to objectively, and I do repeat objectively, determine if the force used was reasonable, if it was necessary, if it was appropriate. Both individuals described as seniors are facing various charges, including resisting arrest and assaulting an officer. At a rally in Lancaster, activists called for the deputy who grabbed the woman by her neck to be fired. We want those sheriff out of the law yes. enforcement. We want them out yes. of our community. The incident happened late last month. Deputies responding to the grocery store for a report of two customers assaulting security. After finding the couple who matched the description, officers detained this man, while the woman he called his wife recorded the encounter. I can't breathe. There's no fight. You took me down to the ground. As she was detained, the deputy warned he was going to strike her. Stop and get punched in the you face. Can't, Turn I around. I can't, but get your neck off my, off my, I can't breathe. If they breathe. did what they said that they did, it still doesn't justify that officer coming over to the lady and taking his arm to her neck and slamming her down on the ground. This morning, the troubling tale of the tape as authorities investigate no, their own. Stop. Both the woman and the man who were arrested were later released. The sheriff says the investigation into the altercation is expected to take several weeks. Back to you. All right, Miguel, thank you. Coming up, it is a weight loss revival for one household name. We've got the details on Jenny Craig's e-commerce comeback and the big name backer making it all possible. That's next on Morning News Now. We're back with some financial headlines. JetBlue and American Airlines will now be flying solo, ending their partnership in the Northeast. CNBC Silvana Hanau joins us again with that and other money news. Silvana, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning. That's right. JetBlue ends its partnership with American Airlines in the Northeast after losing a court fight over the deal. So now I will instead focus on its proposed takeover of Spirit Airlines. The Justice Department sued to block both the JetBlue American deal and JetBlue's agreement to buy Spirit for nearly $4 billion on the grounds that they would hurt competition. Buying Spirit would give JetBlue control of nearly 10% of the U.S. air travel market. The head of OPEC says the search is on for new members to join the cartel. OPEC Secretary General confirming to reporters they are trying to expand the alliance. The group currently has 13 members, primarily in the Middle East, North and West Africa and South America. Ecuador left OPEC in 2020, but has been invited to rejoin. OPEC members are battling tighter crude supplies, worries about an economic slowdown and inflation concerns. And many Americans think tipping culture is out of control. 
A recent survey from Bankrate finds two thirds of people have a negative view in tipping, especially when it comes to contactless and digital payments that have predetermined options that can range between 15 and 35 percent per and 35 percent per transaction. A report from NerdWallet finds many feel the pressure to tip has increased over the past year because technology is making it harder to say no, Joe. I have to say I've gotten very good at hitting the other option and typing same, in a lower same. number. I do the same thing, Joe. You still leave a tip, but sometimes course, it doesn't need to be yes. as high exactly. as what's being recommended. Yes, All right. absolutely. I'm so, with you. Savannah, thanks so much. Appreciate it. it. Weight loss brand Jenny Craig is getting a second chance. It's being revived online. As we reported back in May, the company filed for bankruptcy after more than 40 years in business. Now, the parent company of diet dealmaker Nutrisystem has bought the brand and plans to reboot it through a digital and e-commerce driven model. NBC News business and data reporter Brian Chung joins us now with more on this. All right, so this company is called Wellful Inc. So tell us more about their plan to revive Jenny Craig. And if you were a Jenny Craig member, what does this mean for you? Yeah, well, Wellful will be more familiar to most Americans as the, as the company behind uh, Nutrisystem. So very similar type of brand. They do kind of meal kits. That's part of a diet plan. But Jenny Craig uh, now going to be folded into Wellful after Brandon Adcock, the CEO over at Wellful, decided to buy the intellectual property of Jenny Craig after that company went bankrupt in May, as NBC News' Sarah Rubrik originally reported. So this brand will be revived. The company is saying on a website that it's going to come back in the fall. They're saying you can still rely on the same meals, the same weight loss plan uh, coming back. One difference, Joe, is that they used to have these in-person clinics for personal uh, kind of just guidance in terms of how to go about these meal, meal kits and plans. But uh, this is going to be an e-commerce kind of digital primary brand, which they say they'll continue to offer personalized coaching in some form, but it just won't be in person. Which we've all gotten used to anyway exactly. at this point. Yeah. So, But here's the thing. Now, we're in this era where we've got Wagovi and Ozempic. The medications are so huge. Is Wellful Inc. worried about that and their ability to compete with these medications? Yeah, well, the CEO of Wellful did uh, offer an interview to NBC News, and he was saying, we're not really afraid of Ozempic. We understand understand that that's part of the uh, landscape in terms of competition for weight loss. The drugs have become a lot more prevalent in, in just the last few months. But when it comes to what they want to uh, double down on with Nutrisystem and also Jenny Craig, they are really just trying to basically put all their chips onto meal kits and dieting through the actual things that you're eating. Uh, and they're saying that they think that could be a winning strategy. All right. I remember back when I was young, Nutrisystem was all the rage in, in my community and growing Jenny Craig up, in the all 80s. the parents yep. and Jenny Craig exactly. too. So, you know, we'll see. You know, Jenny Craig shut down. It had about a thousand employees. Yeah. What does this mean for them? Yeah, well, the CEO is saying that he hopes to maybe get in contact with some of them to bring them on board. Now, those 1,000 employees essentially uh, lost their jobs after the collapse of Jenny Craig a few months ago. So, whether or not this company can bring on board all of them, we don't really know. But again, the company is saying they have interest in maybe bringing back at least some of them, Joe. All right, we'll see what happens. Brian Chung, thanks so much. Appreciate your reporting on this. And there's much more morning news now after this. Stay with us. Summer is in full swing, and the movie theater for many is a great place to beat the heat. But in the years since the COVID pandemic, even some of the industry's biggest stars and franchises are struggling to get people back into those seats. And studios in Hollywood are banking on some of those big names to help make up for what has been an inconsistent year at the U.S. box office so far. Mark your July calendars for some of the summer's most highly anticipated movies. Some things have been happening that might be related. Live action Barbie and Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer will both be released on the same day. Some movie buffs are sharing their excitement to watch a double feature. If you're watching both, I think it says a lot about your character depending on which one you choose first. Even on the red carpet. You know, I like seeing opening weekend. Probably Friday, see Oppenheimer first and then Barbie second. Tom Cruise stars in the summer release Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 out next Wednesday. And he's hoping the franchise's seventh installment has the same success as the actor's 2022 mega hit Top Gun Maverick. That film earned $701 million domestically last summer, giving U.S. box offices a major boost. Because people were leaving the movie theater and telling their friends, you have to go see this movie in theaters. In 2023, U.S. box offices have made $1.88 billion since early May. That's down about 2% from the same time last year. And some massive projects like superhero flick The Flash and the final Indiana Jones installment underperformed to expectations. 
Back in the 70s, the massive success of films like Jaws You're gonna need a bigger boat. and Star Wars helped create the concept of the summer blockbuster. Don't everybody thank me at once. Decades later, movie studios release big budget films featuring some of Hollywood's biggest stars and most beloved franchises, anticipating a huge payout. But now, as theatrical releases compete with streaming services, that formula is no longer a guarantee. It's more on the quality of the movie. And so it's not really enough anymore to just be a familiar name, a familiar property to get people to go to theaters. Actors like Cruz are encouraging people to head to the silver screen in person, tweeting these photos, posing with tickets to summer releases and telling I Deadline. I make, I make movies for the big screen. That is what I do. Barbie star Margot Robbie and director Greta Gerwig showed off their movie tickets along with the tweet, mission accepted. Another interesting note, fewer movies are being released in theaters. Back in 2019, between January and the end of June, there were 57 films released in 2,000 theaters or more. This year, only 45. So 57 versus 45. That helps explain why movie ticket sales are down 21% from before the COVID pandemic. Finally this hour, we have got the heartwarming story of one girl's dream to be a yoga teacher. Her name is Kanaya Randall. Oh yeah, and she's nine years old. She's now stretching her summer into a possible career, working toward the 200 hours of yoga needed to be certified. And we are lucky to have Kanaya with us this morning, along with her mother, Brittany Lang. Good to have you both with us. Kanaya, I wanna start with you. Tell me, why do you love yoga so much? Well, yoga helps me stretch my body and it's very fun. Tell me about this process to get accredited. How's it going so far? What do you think of it? It's going well. What's the goal for you? To be a yoga teacher and then teach classes in the park. I'm trying to imagine all the people who are going to show up to learn from you, and that's going to be like an awesome experience for all of them. Brittany, you are a yoga instructor. You began teaching Kanaya at just three years old. First of all, what does it mean for you to watch her fall in love with this activity that, that you guys can share together? I think it's great that she has um, this, um, this drive to be so healthy, and she's always been since she was very young, um, like a leader. She's always, you know, people say bossy, but no, she's a leader. So I'm just glad that she'll be able to teach other people. And she, she has this thing about her where, like, she gets in this mode. You know, she might seem shy right now, but she gets in this mode when she's teaching people or leading people. Even at the playground, we'll go to the playground. She'll have a bunch of kids following her within minutes. I mean, that's just how she is. You can tell that just by talking with Kanaya right now. Brittany, she's teaching other people, but what are the lessons you hope Kanaya takes away from this process? Look, and I is a bit of a perfectionist. And so this is the one thing she does where she is not so hard on herself because she knows each time she falls, she's going to get back up. She's going to keep trying. Um, and so I think that's been a, a good learning curve for her overall in life because, you know, that is that's for everything, everything you do. So, Kanaya, what is your favorite yoga pose? Um, the bridge, the one that you do bridge? Yeah, bridge. The bridge? What, bridge. What is the hardest one? What's the one you've had the toughest time trying to figure out? Crow. What was that? Crow. Crow, what's the crow? Describe the crow to me. So you have to get on your hands and then you place your leg in between your elbow and balance with only your hands. That sounds pretty hard. All right, Brittany, what's the lesson you hope everyone can take away from, from what your daughter is doing? I think just go for it, whatever you're interested in. She had a, an idea, like, could I do this? And so we, we made a little fundraiser in the community, saved up for it, and then she's going to start this summer for her 200 hour. She'll complete by the end of the summer for sure. But I think just go for it if you have an idea. You don't have to wait or hesitate. You can make it happen. That is a great message for all of us. Kanaya Randall and Brittany Lang, thank you so much for joining us. And Kanaya, good luck with get, getting that accreditation. We can't wait to see what you do with it. Thank you. All right. Have thank a great you. morning.
Twitter has some new competition this morning. That's because Meta launched its new text-based app, Thread. CEO Mark Zuckerberg says at least 10 million people signed up within the first few hours. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin takes a closer look. This morning, the highly anticipated rival platform to Twitter is now live. Facebook and Instagram's parent company, Meta, launching threads overnight. The new text-based app arriving a day earlier than expected. It kind of looks like this right now. It looks like a mashup of like Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. <laughs> Overnight founder Mark Zuckerberg announcing Threads reached 10 million signups in its first seven hours. Celebrities from Oprah to Kim Kardashian to Jennifer Lopez already joining the app that looks fairly similar to Twitter. The launch coming just days after Twitter announced limits on its app, including how many posts users can read per day. The change is led by controversial billionaire Elon Musk. I'll say what I want to say, and if... if, if uh... If the consequence of that is losing money, so be it. Meta describing its vision as creating positive and creative space to express ideas, leveraging Instagram's more than 2 billion users. Posts on the app can be up to 500 characters long with links, photos and videos up to five minutes. Content creator Drex Lee, who makes money as an influencer on Instagram, received early access to threads. What grade do you give it so far? Um... The ease, I mean, everything has been running pretty smoothly. But reaction has not all been positive. Some users taking to Twitter, calling threads chaotic and reporting glitches. The biggest concern, the newsfeed's algorithm. I don't want a discovery feed. I don't want to see what's trending. I just want to follow my friends. That's it. Users waiting to see what both apps and both billionaires do next. Elon Musk has uh, challenged Mark Zuckerberg to a, an actual fight. Uh, but right now we're getting to see it. Uh, kind of on this great public stage. Thanks to Aaron McLaughlin for that report. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. Stay with us. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.